my next guest, he's a professional mixed martial artist with a record of eight wins and two losses. He last fought on October 22nd, where he defeated Renato Valente by unanimous decision. He is a huge NFL fan here, and he's also joining me today to talk about all things in sports here in MMA and the NFL. Please welcome onto the show, Josh Friend. How are you doing, Josh? Man, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I'm glad that we can we can get this up. I know we scheduled it and we, we were getting to it, but it's glad to finally get it going, man. Same, same man. I'm, I'm very pumped to have you on. I'm very excited. You know, it's always great to talk to an athlete like yourself and even more fun when, you know, you also have some stuff to talk about the NFL as well, man. So I'm very pumped for this. Heck yeah. yeah. Now, Josh, uh, real quick, man, just, you know, you're an 82 mixed martial artist, correct? Yes. Now, and I want to jump into that, man. So how long have you been training, man? Cool. Uh, training has been a long, long time. I think I've probably been training a total of 10 years, maybe. And then uh, I'd say about seven years of actually, like, competing. I remember my first uh, amateur uh, bout was a kickboxing fight. It was, like, seven yeah. years ago. So total time, about 10 years of training, yeah. Awesome, man. Now – why did you decide to MMA, right? That's the popular question here. Why did you go in there, man? Why did you decide to, to step in there and make this a career? Uh, because, you know, like I've always had aspirations of being, you know, a shortstop for the Pittsburgh Pirates. I was big into baseball. My dad got me into baseball very young. I played baseball for well over 13 years. I played football and I gave football a shot at in college and whatnot. But I realized my ceiling with it and I've always wanted to be a fighter. Uh, I've always just been drawn to the aspects that I learned from wrestling and the lifestyle, the grind that it takes. And I just wanted to immerse myself in it. And once I saw the ceiling of where it was with football, I decided to, you know, give fighting an actual chance. And I mean, it, it's done well for me so far, I'd say. Now, there's a lot of people that, you know, will get into fighting different ways and will fall in love with just professional sports certain ways right we all have our moments you know for me yeah. it was watching uh stefan bonner and forrest griffin when it happened you know ultimate fighter season one i was man i can't, I can't remember it was about six seven years old man and i just remember watching that fight and i was like i want to see continue seeing that like that's interesting to me plus you know all the drama yeah. and all that crap that happened on the show right so <laughs> I, I fell in love with the sport what was your moment did you have a moment or was it just mark mixed martial arts just a way for you to compete <laughs> I think it would go back a little bit further than actual mixed martial arts. Okay. If it would go down specifically to one martial art, it would be wrestling. Okay. Uh, in high school, we were we were going through team meetings for winter sports, and my friends were like, "Oh, you should try basketball." But you know, I'm tall, but I've always wanted to wrestle, and I've always been a skinny kid, so like I've, I wanted to learn how to you know defend myself, I guess you'd say. And I had a little meeting with one of our wrestling coaches and in that meeting he was like what would you rather be known for dunking on someone or being able to beat someone up and at that moment I was like I would much rather be known for being able to beat someone up than dunk a basketball which I can dunk but I'm not like I'm just more drawn to that the physical aspect of it and, you know, so it's very interesting, right? So you're going in there and that's, that's such a great way to put it out there. So when that was told to you, is that, that's exactly what sold you to that moment and to this yeah, career? Yeah. I'm for, for as far as wrestling, but as far as like fighting, that's a longer story that uh, <laughs> it, it had to do with me eventually getting into a fight in high school and just absolutely molly whopping this kid and realizing that, I might actually be good at this a little bit better than I was with team sports. Like I was good with team sports, but the being individualistic about it and knowing myself and knowing how to train and how to get ready for things. Like it was just more drawn to that. Now, what was the biggest thing about pursuing this kind of career that shocked you the most? Um, I would have to say politics, you okay. know, I, I got away from football a little bit because there's a lot, there's a little bit of politics in it, but on, especially on like regional scenes and different things like that, you get, you get these guys who are just trying to make money off of you or trying to feed you to certain people, trying to make a name off of you. That was the first learning shock I had. 
you know, I'm, I'm used to like from wrestling, getting roughed up from day to day. And that's just part of the game. But when it comes to the whole business side of it, it's, it's pretty shocking sometimes. And, you know, so it, it, you know, it's pretty cut and cut dry, right. Cutthroat as people would say. Yeah. Yeah. Now for you though, you know, so I think that, I think one of the best things for mixed martial arts though, is like you said, individual sport, right? If the guy, you know, like in football, if someone misses a block, you get sacked, turnover, that's it, man. I mean, it, it could be game over, you know, and that yeah. and, and it may not be entirely the quarterback's fault for you, right? You're, you're stepping in there, you're fighting by yourself. You're going in there again, competing by yourself. Now, does that add more pressure to you though, as, as a professional athlete there in that sense? <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, I wouldn't say that that adds any pressure to it. Uh, that That's what I enjoy. That's what I've always liked. I can't blame it on anyone else. If I lose, it's yeah. literally only my fault. I have to be able to go back and look at what I did wrong or what I mentally messed up on, physically messed up on. And that's really just being true to yourself and take, taking responsibility for your actions leading up to it, you know? Definitely. Now, your last fight was October 22nd. And obviously, you won, you know, unanimous decision. And, you know, obviously you had lost one before, but you were still, you were on a, on a win streak. Right. And you're yeah. a very talented fighter. You have six finishes out of the eight, you know, now coming off your win though, what was your mentality going into that? Is it hard going into a fight coming off a loss for you? How do you handle that mentally? Oh, uh, I mean, it was, it was, I'm not going to front. Like it was pretty difficult at times because uh, even before I went on that win streak, like I was injured for a better part of a year and a half, had a couple surgeries and I finally get the ball rolling after moving out here to Colorado. And it just felt like things were coming together. You know, it was going to be a storybook ending. I'll get the title. I'll go to the UFC. And then, you know, things didn't go my way. I got clipped and then I got finished. And that's just the part, that's part of the game coming back, being off of that run, going back into this previous fight, it was a little bit of a hurdle to get over at first. Um, but then that's just when you go deep in within, within yourself and just, Hey, I need to put in this extra work because the confidence only comes from putting the work in. If you go into things, not confident, it's because you didn't prepare correctly. Yep. Lack of preparation. Correct. Yeah. No, a hundred, a hundred percent. So, you know, it was a good win for you, man. How how's it feel though, to be able to bounce back like that and, and get your hand raised? Uh, it felt good. It felt very, very good. Like a big weight was relieved. Uh, I wish I could have been a little bit more aggressive. I think in the fight, I wasn't aggressive enough. I was more of just trying to set things up too much instead of just going out and fighting. But I'm happy to get the win and just very you know, excited for the future and what my next move is going to be. Definitely. Now, you're an MMA fan, right? And the way people characterize it, characterize mma fans in general it's either you're casual or you're a hardcore right you know i, I yeah. i'm a hardcore right we, we watch we pay attention to these things so we understand and we know i guess certain things in mma like a loss can is is harder it's it's harder for an mma fighter than it is for a damn you know for the new england patriots this season you know they'll they'll be <laughs> next year for them you know it's, it's a very it's a diff, different kind of hit you know and a lot of people just like casuals right or just people that don't pay attention to the sport they think it's like uh wwe we know you make a crap load of money and it's all smooth sailing there and every, everyone gets paid a lot and you know aren't realistic with these kind of things right but it's hard right i mean a loss a, a loss in a mixed martial arts career right as you're trying to get to you know like the ufc for example i mean it's yeah. hard to deal with whenever it does happen right correct yeah oh dude uh extremely hard you know this this sport, uh, even today in today's age, like it's a, what have you done for me lately? And if you're coming off a loss that, I mean, me personally, just coming off losses, I lost, you know, sponsors. I didn't get half my paycheck. You miss some money that you were thinking about hoping that you would have. And no, I mean, we're not out here making millions of dollars, especially guys on the regional scene, even guys in the UFC. Like we're not blowing up the banks just yet. This is a long-term thing. So it is very difficult, but if you have the right circle around you, the right mentality about it, you know, especially for me, it was never about the money. I never got in this to be rich or famous. Like I got in this because I just love fighting and I love competing. 
against another person. So it, it's hard, but man, it's it's really worth it. What's the, I'm assuming, you know, the, when it comes to mixed martial arts, you know, the best feeling would be, you know, what was it, getting your hand raised, correct? I mean, the yeah, prize at the I end mean, of this. It, it, it flies, like, because the time in the cage, uh, the, my last fight is the first time in a while that I spent 15 minutes, and, dude, it felt like 30 seconds. It just flies by so fast, and that little brief moment at the end when they're about to raise your hand and they say your name, it's all that elation, the high, that's everything you chase. And then for me personally, like, when I get back to the locker room, I'm already, like, all right, don't talk to me. It's fine. I won. Cool. Like I'm not really cool with accepting praise and all that. So I'm just like, all right, let's get back to the gym. Let's get on board for the next one. I just, I'm chasing that high, that split second high that you get at the end of a win, a fight when you get your hand raised. I don't know. It's just very addicting. Now you handle your business. Like, like you said here, you know, six finishes out of your eight wins out here. Is there a level that you went to a decision? So is there a level of anxiety when people are reading scorecards there because of some of the issues we've seen in the past when it comes to judging? Uh, yeah, I mean, for that fight in particular, I don't think that I was nervous about not getting my hand raised. I definitely felt like I did enough to win that fight. But, excuse me, yeah, I, I completely understand that because I've had a split decision win before way back in the beginning of my uh, pro career. And it is, it's a little nerve wracking because in that moment when you're just like, oh man, what was their perception of the fight? Because I know my perception, what's yeah. theirs and what kind of background do they have? Do they have the ability or the capacity to understand what they just watched? So yeah, sometimes it is a little nerve wracking. Definitely not. Let me shift to this. You know, UFC 269 happened this past weekend, right? Crazy event. UFC did it right. And you know, that I, th I really feel like this has been a solid year for them been hitting the mark when it comes to most of these pay-per-views you know it, it's been solid top-notch fighting I think for the first time like for for myself you know watching this sport there's been various fights not just in the UFC but all over MMA where you could say man it's really hard to say fight of the year fight of the year fight of the year and I know everyone's gonna want to say Gaethje and Chandler but and it, it probably is but there's so many fights that are deemed worthy of that and I feel like it's been a solid year for not just the UFC but mixed martial arts but we are talking about the UFC yeah. right now. And again, just yeah. and I happened this past weekend. Great fights. What stood out to you the most? Honestly, yeah. man, I, I got to give uh, the her roses while she's here. Like Pena came out and upset the entire world. We thought that Nunez was the go. We thought she was unbeatable. At least I personally, I from the consensus that I got, everyone thought the same thing. And I didn't give Pena a shot in the dark. And that is why this is the greatest sport. Because on, I'm not going to use the phrase, any given Sunday, any given Saturday night, anything can happen. She came out and she walked down the champ, beat her on the feet, took her down and choked her out. Like That was amazing, amazing upset. And you know what? When she clipped her right away, she came in, moved forward. And I believe she threw a left or a right, whichever one to open up the second round, I told myself, okay, I think she's in trouble. I think Amanda's in trouble right here. And because there was Thank just, a, yeah, like you, you just, you've seen Amanda get hit, you know, you've seen Amanda get hit and you just, you, she wouldn't flinch when she yeah. flinched there. I was like, okay, like, I'm not trying to make a big deal out of things, but I don't, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see, you know, believe it or not. So I had this a few months ago and look, folks, I'm, I'll, I picked, yeah, I picked Amanda Nunez to win this fight. You know, I did, you know, I thought, that obviously we know there's the talks about the Kayla Harrisons in the world, right? Going out there and fighting mm -hmm. her. I thought Juliana would be the one would be her toughest test. I thought she'd have an opportunity to be able to do that just because the grappling, the grappling aspect in that, right? I just thought that yeah. she had a very distinct advantage in that. And it's been a while. Like I really can't remember where Amanda had gotten taken down and dominated, you know, usually if she gets yep. you down, I mean, she's, she's going in there for the kill and about to finish you pretty, pretty, pretty fast after that. So I thought that was going to be the challenge perceived, but I mean, come on. And no one thought, right. Everyone was betting. I mean, yeah, it, it was, it was insane. It was absolutely insane. I know that you had to do a shoey, right? Yes, I did. Saw, uh, Cause of this event. 
Ty Tuivasa, man, he is just so entertaining. He went out there and did his thing against Augusta Sakai and got a phenomenal knockout, like bent over, leg behind his body. And yeah, I, uh, for the radio show that I do weekly here in Denver, I did a shoey on the radio and I was, you know, I was going to be one of those guys who's going to go get a clean shoe, but, you know, I wanted to be authentic. I got to use the shoes that I wear daily make it original because I'm not going to let anyone spit in. I, hey, I can't let anyone spit in my beer, so I got to be authentic in some facet of it because oh. you're not spitting in my beer. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of beer was it? Uh, I It was uh, Coors Light, uh, just to keep a brand on it, you know, for Denver and Colorado. The mountains were blue, baby, and it was pretty good. It was pretty intense, you know. So the main event, right, Charles Oliveira against Poirier. So I thought to myself, okay, Again, the trend, right? Because I, I like to do a lot. I do like to do a lot of betting here, and I like to give people betting advice yep. here. So, I thought the smart money was only on Oliveira because I thought that Dustin was getting overvalued a lot. And by overvalued, I mean, I think that by popular opinion, I thought a lot of people thought that Dustin was going to go out there and win the belt from Charles. Yeah, Charles was per per perceived as a quitter, and all the people would say that, right? And they questioned that, which, quite frankly, man, I don't get. I don't get right. He, he, he sure as hell didn't look like a quitter against Michael Chandler, man. No, <laughs> that, that's not at all. Crazy, crazy. And that's like, that's the crazy thing about it is you can shift the perception of public, especially casuals when you don't really know who is what you see DP coming off a win against McGregor. And just the other day, I had a conversation with a random chick about how amazing McGregor is and you know those type of fans who are like oh McGregor the casuals. Beat Godzilla the casuals you know and it makes you forget just how good certain people are and just like you said overvaluate some people in that aspect a lot of people were looking at it you know all feelings no facts but the facts are right in front of us that Oliveira was uh, exactly what he's shown to be and he went out and proved it against Dustin Poirier yeah. Now, and, you know, when you look at the numbers, right, whether it was finishes, takedown percentage, actual strikes landing, like percentages, right? I mean, Charles was had a significant advantage. Finishes. He, he did. The only thing that made me caution going up against Dustin, right, because we love Dustin, right? You know, mm -hmm. awesome person is, you know, I've seen Dustin come back from fighting Gaethje and Hooker and, you know, we've seen him fight some of the best fighters in the world, right? And with Charles, again, a lot of people were like, okay, well, look at the competition, look at what's happening, you know, a little bit of an inconsistency there and what people were talking. And look, I'm not saying that Dustin was overvalued because of the fighter he is. I just think that Vegas, right? Vegas likes to win, right? I don't know if you do any, any yeah. betting, Josh, but the way oh, Vegas is designed, yeah. Yeah, the way Vegas is designed, man, is they look at what's getting overvalued there and that, that's how they make money, right? Popular opinion mm -hmm. was Dustin. So, of course, he was going to be the uh, odds on favorite there against Charles. So that's the only reason I thought that they were, he was getting overvalued by Vegas. I thought it was just easy money for them to make off people betting on mm -hmm. Dustin. That's just the only reason why, I mean, biggest takeaway though, man, Charles versus Justin, man. Is, I mean, that's the fight to make, right? I think so too. I think that's a banger of a fight. And I mean, that just validates a lot of things because Chandler was coming over and people weren't sure how that was going to be, you know, even though he beat hooker and, Oliveira beating Dustin, and if he goes out there and he beats Justin, I mean, you can't argue anymore about how true champion he is, undisputed. Let me let me get your opinion though. Islam Makachev is, is is a big name right now, right? Everyone's talking yeah. about the damage he could do. Am I crazy to tell you to think that I think Islam beats all these guys? Am I crazy? You can tell me I'm crazy. You're, I mean, honestly, you're not crazy because the level of wrestling that that guy has is unbelievable but i'm waiting for the day that he fights someone like Darius, Benil. like oh, Benil, oh, who's gonna go out fight. there and i that oh that's uh, i guess my just blood boiling i'm so excited for that i wait we're gonna see if Benil can like kind of confuse makachev like by separating his consciousness a little bit like hitting him hard enough to where he like freezes for a second because i haven't seen makachev get hit yet like, I want to know what he's like when he gets hit, when he gets stumbled. What does he feel like? Does he recover well? Does he just dive in? Does he get caught with something? So that's going to be an interesting matchup for sure. Yeah, I think, you know, I think Benio is probably the, is getting, well, he is the toughest test, but I think 
he'll be the tough toughest of the guys that I think can have the best chance to be able to beat him because with Gaethje, right? With Gaethje and Gaethje's good on the ground too, right? Gaethje's good on the yeah. ground. So, man, it's just a whole mind blowing thing, man, that what we're about to witness here in 2022, because I think that if Makachev can get through Darius, I think I, I would go to Vegas and, and put money that he's going to become lightweight champ by the end of the year. Oh, I, I would, I would definitely take the odds on that for sure. Oh man. It's, it's very interesting there. Any other takeaway from UFC 269, man? O'Malley won. Um, Good win for him. Yeah, O'Malley is just a superstar. Uh, even like not even talking about like his fighting, if we sit his fighting aside in the entertainment value, the things that the guy is doing outside of fighting, what he's using, his platform. And if you just pay attention to the things that he's investing in, the moves that he's making, it's very smart when you get a group of people who are willing to follow you, whether it's on Twitch, social media, buy your merchandise, buy your NFTs, yeah. just the guy's a marketing genius. He's a superstar. Just I'm excited to continue to watch that guy rise. Him against Cody Garbrandt, I think, should be next. Cody, you know, unfortunately, is going through that down, downward slide. I think Cody Garbrandt should never fight again. I absolutely love opinion. Cody Garbrandt. He came up through the uh, Pittsburgh, and I've watched him fight a lot. And he he's a UFC champion forever in history. He will be a UFC champion. He's put on amazing performance. He has a highlight tape of knockouts that anyone would dream to have. I don't want to see Cody Garbrandt get knocked out again. I just don't. You know, and you know, that's crazy, right? The throw and agony of the sport, right? You're on top of the world. Yep. And then the numbers, right? One in five since, since winning the championship, man. And it, it, it's, it's kind of sad to watch. You know, it, it is, but it's, it is. it's part of the game, right? Man, this isn't, like I said earlier, uh, and this other one, like this isn't baseball, this isn't football, basketball, where you, you don't can reset hide after on the a sidelines. Year. Yeah, you, you can't hide on the sidelines and gather a paycheck. Like you have to actually compete and win. And when your time's up, everyone's time is different. Like Dominic Cruz is still out there winning. But Cody Garbrandt had his run. And I think it's just safer for the future to just take some time off maybe not even quit fully just take like a couple years off let yourself heal or maybe transition i don't know man i mean like tr everyone bags on trailer right or knocks on it and what they're doing right but i mean at the end of the day i mean i think that he just needs to take whatever money he can get right and yeah. what's safe for him because you don't want that you don't want to get that brain damage and you know cte is a thing and you don't want somebody to have to go through that so who would you want to see uh, O'Malley fight then, though? Uh, I want to see O'Malley fight, honestly, anyone that isn't in the top 10. Uh, I, I don't think that he uh, – I don't think that, you know, he's there just yet. But I do want to see the Sugar Show. I want to see him against a quality opponent, but not someone that is too far away from his skill set just yet because – that's a train that you just don't want to see derailing from a business standpoint and from a fan standpoint. Definitely. You know, very, very marketable, marketable guy. Now let me shift to this, right? Yeah. The NFL, right? You're a huge football fan, you know, Pittsburgh yeah. Steelers fan, correct? Oh yeah. I've seen some of your memes on there on, on Instagram. <laughs> so so it's, it's all good right now. How are you feeling about your Steelers season? Ah, man, I, I'm feeling such a roller coaster of emotions. <laughs> like I last year was amazing until it wasn't. This year started off great. Beat the Bills. All right, we're in this thing. And then it's just been up, down, up, down, up, down. And like last the, like, uh, the <laughs> like oh, it's just so heartbreaking. And to see what was it Minnesota we played last? Like to On see Thursday. even with even with the Baltimore game, like we, no, I'm not going to say we, but Pittsburgh had the chance to win on, they're in the game and Ben Roethlisberger is doing everything he can at his old age to do anything. It's just, it's, it's heartbreaking sometimes, you know? Shout out to Deontay Johnson for a second here, man. Deontay yes. Johnson. I have him on my fantasy football team, both of my teams, man. And he's Smart carrying man. me, man. He's so awesome. <laughs> shout out, shout out to him. But yeah, obviously, like, right, like, here's the question, right? Ben's going to leave after this year. Let's, it's pretty much done, I think. 
Don't don't say Ben is gonna leave. Say Ben is gonna retire. Okay. Because I don't want to see Ben play anywhere else. I mean, me me neither, right? You know, says the guy who's a Brady fan who's wearing a Tampa Bay Tampa Bay shirt right now as we're talking here. But okay, <laughs> fine. Let's just say he's gonna retire, right? I got I got a quarterback for you. I got a quarterback that I think should replace him. Okay, Jimmy Garoppolo. What do you think? Who you know, that's a name that I have not heard. That that's a fresh perspective. Um, I don't know. I don't. I don't really know if I believe too much in Garoppolo. What I think that I think that you know he has some very ups, very some high hopes, but I just don't know if I believe in him too much. Uh, I honestly think that my hopes, Aaron Rodgers. Don't say, don't say Aaron Rodgers. Oh, okay. <laughs> but let's be realistic, Josh. Let's be realistic, right? It doesn't look like he's gonna move. I don't think he's no, gonna move. No. Jimmy's no, he, gonna move. He, Jimmy's gonna move, and I think that's a, I think that's a good option. I, I'm, I'm interested to see where that one goes. I do. I mean, I don't know if I'm alone in this feeling, but I think that Haskins has the ability to win a couple games. I think that he is far more superior athletically than Mason Rudolph, and I don't know why we keep leaving leading with Mason Rudolph. It's interesting, but. You know, I was, hey. it, you know, man, so I lived in Oklahoma for about three and a half, almost four years. I lived there the entire time Mason Rudolph played at Oklahoma State. Four-year starter, Oklahoma State. Nothing impressive, man. I thought that was decent. You know, if you're playing quarterback, if you're a four-year starter playing quarterback, odds are, especially with the way the game's evolving, yeah, like you stay there to continue to develop and work on your craft there because you weren't good enough to go to the NFL yet. Trevor Just Lawrence, yep. look at all these quarterbacks, right? They, they wait. As soon as they're eligible, they leave. And with mm-hmm. Mason, he couldn't win the big one, right? Not even in college, right? There's no, there was no clutch gene. And not saying that whether you win or college, that's going to you know make or break you. Look at Mahomes, right? But I just didn't see that dog yeah. in him. Too careful, too safe. Yeah. And you look at these talents, Herbert, Mahomes, Allen, right? Way different than what Mason Rudolph is. Look at Mac Jones. You could literally tell the difference between these two guys. The reason why I think Garoppolo is the best option for Pittsburgh is because he's very attainable. You're not going to have to destroy your franchise because, I mean, for Rodgers, I mean, who knows, maybe two, three first rounders to get him. Who knows? Yeah, you have to give up a lot for that. Yeah, so I think Jimmy's the safer option, the cheaper option. And here's the thing, Josh, your team, the Pittsburgh Steelers, don't have to blow this thing up. The rebuild, allegedly, is pretty much done. The O-line's getting better. You have your running back. You don't need Juju. <laughs> I don't know what you believe in Juju or not. <laughs> you don't need Juju, bro. We don't need, you don't need to pay him. He might come back because maybe no one else will pay him. But you got Deontay and Claypool, even though Claypool, you know, sometimes makes questionable decisions out there. But you have two solid receivers. Hell, Pittsburgh, you hit on receivers in the fifth or sixth round for crying out loud. You know, you're I mean, a solid forget, organization. Don't forget Washington. Washington's out there still doing his yeah. thing. He's, you know, he's doing very well. Yeah, I'm glad you said it because I had my buddy on my back about Claypool. Like, I think that Claypool has such an upside to him. 100%. And I mean, when you're you're a 23 year old kid with a million dollar, like a bunch of million dollar bills in your pocket, and you're going out there just living life, yeah, you're gonna make stupid decisions. But that's something that you can learn from Absolutely. and you can move forward. I 100% agree with you. So you know, like this team's ready to compete. They're ready. Yeah. They're in a championship window as long as they get the quarterback right, you know. Yeah, but and now that you, I think you've talked me into it because you're right. We don't need, we don't need some crazy, super athletic, like Patrick Mahomes type guy. We just need, we need a good guy who can manage a game, make the throws. And like Najee is just getting started. That's the big thing is our offensive line is my biggest concern. And then everything else, yeah, everything else is in place. You think you've talked me into it. I'm telling you, man. I'm (laughs) telling you. You know, and here's the thing about Jimmy. The biggest thing, right, for the Steelers, right? Okay, you make sure you try to get a backup, right? Make sure, like a Minshew. I think Minshew is the perfect backup to have. And I think, and it it should not cost you a lot. So with Jimmy, solid. When he's healthy, again, the biggest issue is when he's healthy, he's solid. Winning record. Got you to a Super Bowl the one year he was healthy. The keyword was the one here, right? Those are the keywords yeah. here. But good enough to win. Good enough. This guy 
had Tom Brady made Tom Brady tradable, you know, to, to Bill Belichick. He made him exp- expendable is a better phrase here. Yeah. So, and I think with Pittsburgh is, and, and I'm telling you, I'm telling everyone right here, I'm not a Steelers fan. I'm not a Steelers fan. <laughs> I'm just being unbiased here. I truly believe that if they get the quarterback right, I think they're in the Super Bowl window versus what a lot of people may think, man. I think they can still win the division. I still do because I, I still think that that's attainable division. by the way that things are going down. I just saw the report for the Browns, like everybody's out with COVID next this week. So <laughs> everybody. And they have the, a very tough schedule. I mean, all these guys have tough schedules. I, I don't see when you look at their schedules, not one of these teams is playing a team with a losing record to end out the year. Yep. So it, it's insane. Tough. It's insane, man. And it, it's, Crazy man, but I again, you heard it here first, man. Jimmy Garoppolo to the Steelers. <laughs> I think that that's going to be the result, man. That's what you need to do to go out there because you don't want to draft a Kenny Pickett. I don't know if you pay attention to college football. I was just about to ask you, like, because I mean, I'm even though I'm from Pittsburgh, I'm a more I'm more of a Penn State fan than I am a Pitt fan. But I've seen the big things going I like on Penn Pitt State. this year. Your opinion on Kenny Pickett? Like, do you think he is an NFL quarterback? I think he's a poor man's version of Justin Herbert. I think so. You know, I see that. I and, see and that. 100%. Look, I'm going to tell you this, right? The thing about quarterbacks in college, right? And people are like, oh, you can't. A lot of things you can't judge off one. You're not going to judge a fighter off one fight, right? You're not. Yep. So you can't judge people off that. I'm going to tell you something. I saw Joe Burrow play. And my the very first time I saw him play, was against UT, I believe it was week, week two or week three of his senior year before anyone even talked about him. I texted my friend, that works. It's done. Number one pick. People thought I was a lunatic. And obviously we, we saw what happened, right? Herbert, yeah. I did not understand why people mocked this guy so much. Because, you know, Herb, a lot of people were downing this guy. And I said, he's big, athletic. You know, I think that he can be just as good as what Trevor, the Trevor Lawrence hype train was. Didn't understand why people yeah. weren't trying to Take Herbert number one. And now, you know, you, you know it now. Now you'd pay him. You'd pay him. Now Tell you him know him. why, yeah. Special. I completely agree with you on that. Herbert so, is I, – I got a chance to watch him play out here uh, just two weeks ago when he played the Broncos. I got tickets to the game, and, like, he is just exciting to watch. Yeah, he looks different. So my opinion on this year's class is there isn't a quarterback I would take within the top 12, 13 picks. I think they're better off trading back because – like for Houston, right, or a Philadelphia, right? I don't think Jalen Hurts is the answer. You know, I don't think so for, like, Philly. No. But he's better than these guys, right? Now, these guys may have yeah. better mechanics when they're throwing, but at the same time, I don't think they're game-changing changing players. I mean, you know how hard it is for a quarterback to go out there and live up to their first-round pick, you know, hype? Yeah. It's hard. Yeah, it's hard. that's hard. And I have questions about Kyler Murray, too. You know, I question Kyler. I question Kyler right now, to this day right now, just because of the fact that, you know, with the Cardinals, it's the same thing every single year, right? You start off hot, you get some good wins, and then you slow down because of injuries or because of certain things, right? It just, it falls down. So with Pickett, right, going back, going back to Pickett here, I think he's a poor man's version of of Herbert. I don't think he's as strong. I don't think he's, yeah, I think he's got a lesser arm. I think he's Mm -hmm. an average quarterback. I think he's a B, B minus, B plus, I think he can't reach Herbert's potential right here. And I'm really watching myself here. Cause I know people are going to watch this from me. Because yeah, they're Antonio already here. recording. Like, all right, I'm waiting. <laughs> oh brother. My, when I dropped my In trade, Lance, years. when I, when I dropped my Trey Lance comp here, man, they I'm looking right though. I'm looking right <laughs> on that. So when it comes to Pickett, though, I don't think he's going to be a game changer. I think that he can go to a, like a new England, right. Or Mac Jones is that and have similar success to that. But I just don't see it. I don't see any wow. That's where I'm getting at. I, I need to see a wow. Yeah. Something that like tells you that person looks different. Just look. It wasn't different. the fake slide for you, dude. The fake slide. I mean, and his <laughs> response was stupid. Changing the game. I I didn't like the play. I didn't like the play to be honest with you because I do think that the quarterback position is protected a lot. But at the yeah. same time, there wasn't a rule. Hey, exactly. It wasn't, there wasn't like a rule. I, how exactly you're gonna do something that you know creates the change to the game yeah i mean you took advantage that there was no rule kind of kind of cool in a sense but yeah i I get what you're saying (laughs) but it wasn't against the rules right it wasn't against the rule i'm not a fan of malik willis no not Not a fan of matt corral i don't even know if i pronounced that right not a fan of him (laughs) uh who's who's the other guy it's just a bad i 
told everyone two years ago, Spencer Rattler, where people were saying consensus number one pick, didn't like him. Sloppy mechanics, rushed a lot of things, I just immaturity. Saw he's a, South Carolina. He a transferring to South Carolina? South yeah. Carolina. Dude, everyone's transferring right now. I think the USC guy's tra- transferring. Who else, <sighs> man? There's man, there's so many quarterbacks transferring right now. It's crazy, man. I wonder what yeah. Penn State's going to do, though, at quarterback. I believe Clifford's leaving. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of interested to see how that goes too. Um I haven't really been keeping too much up with it right now, but it's I'm kind of interested to see where that goes in the direction. Yeah, so again, quarterback position is going to be something, you know, talked about over the next few months and again, you're going to hear all these hypes about oh, four quarterbacks are taking the first round. Good lord, man. If they're take if three are taken within the top 15, Josh, it's done, man. I think That's it's such wasted, a Houston it's thing wasted. to do. It's a wasted pick because, like you said, none of these guys stand out. None of these guys are just wowing you and thinking. Because if you're a, a top 10 pick, you're going in there to play immediately. You're not going in there to just, you know, take some time and transfer in. So why would you waste the top 10, 15 picks on a quarterback? Yeah, and billionaires aren't – billionaire owners aren't patient right now, man, to tell you, oh, yeah, let's just wait it out. Look at Justin Fields. You know, with Justin Fields yeah. and, and Trevor Lawrence, you saw something there. I feel bad for Trevor. Right, good old Urban's, you know, trying to take him down there. But at least with Justin, yeah. you know, that's the guy. You know, one of my friends that's a Steelers fan is like, man, I really wish Pittsburgh could have gotten Justin Fields. I, you know, I don't hate the thought of Justin Fields because I think that Pittsburgh overall is better than Chicago from a team standpoint, cultural standpoint, that I think he probably would have flourished in that uh, system. But that's just not how it went, you know? Yeah. Do you, how do you think uh, – what do you think about Mac? Mac Jones. I think Mac Jones, I think that he fell into a very, very good position. You know, he is very similar to Tom Brady. He does not wow you athletically, but when you have the correct system around you, I mean, New England has a plethora of tight ends that just dink and dunk down the field. Like you're not going to stop them. And then they're back to the old Patriots back to when they were, when Tom Brady was just getting started, like their defense is amazing them. right now yeah running the football effectively you know i think so my comp for mac right because i okay so i'm gonna let you in on this right here everyone hates me right now because of my mac jones <laughs> i'm not a mac jones guy i'm not a mac jones fan no uh, i think he's below average at best like what brady was right people were saying he's below average at best right yep i think there's been a lot of lucky breaks man and i think a lot of people don't read into this right what kind of competition you're you're, you're going up against right so I wasn't a fan of the guy. Then I've seen him work, put in some time in there. And you know who he reminds me of? Who? And it's not Brady. He reminds me of Dak. Prescott? Yeah, he reminds me a lot of Dak Prescott. So let, 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 okay, let, let, let me interested. tell you this. So let me tell you this, right? So Dak Prescott came, came in as a fourth-round draft pick out of Mississippi State. You know, Dak was decent in college. You know, he was. He had, to, he had his moments. He had Mississippi State ranked at number one. At some point, right? That's a pretty big accomplishment, especially in, in college football. Number one in the nation, yeah. even for a week. That's a huge accomplishment. Over here, uh, I live in San Antonio, Texas. People were going crazy when the college college team here got ranked twenty third here. So you know, <laughs> you know, no, shout out to the shout out to UTSA. So going in going in for Dak. What did Dak and what did Mac have? Right, going going into the rookie season, top offensive line. Mm-hmm. Now let's take the defensive part out of this, right? But the Cowboys had a, de- a decent, good, uh, good defense, right? Average, right? Nothing crazy that stuck out. The Pats do. The Pats have a crazy secondary, right? But again, competent yeah. defense, excellent running game. You know, uh, Dak had Zeke to lean on. And then freaking Mac has Damian Harris and freaking Ramondre Stevenson running the football, man. And effective <laughs> plan here, right? He had weapons around him. I don't care what people, people are going to talk shit, but here's the thing. Hunter Henry wasn't, isn't, isn't a scrub. John New Smith went healthy, isn't a scrub. You know, yeah. Aguilar's got some good athletic ability there. Jacoby Myers, one of the guys like Julian Edelman, you know, who was undrafted. Look what he did, right? And then look at Dak, a Des Bryant there, right? He still had Jason mm-hmm. Witten there t- near the end, right? Good offensive-minded coach right there with Jason Garrett there. Coddled by the system. And they had the advantage of the schedule. What I mean by that. So the schedule was, you know, the Cowboys finished fourth the year before and the Patriots had finished third the year before. So they played bottom line schedules from their division. Yeah. 
there's been a lot of easy games. Dak was being able to run through the completion percentage that he, that he had as a rookie, about 60, 68, 69%. Max flirting with the 70, 69, 70%. That's what the completion percentage is right now. So they're being efficient, good offensive line, good coaching, good running game. Let's take the pressure off you. Easier schedule so you can get on these win streaks over here because people don't tell me that the Jets, the Jets are a big, a competent team to beat. Don't tell me the Miami Dolphins are a competent team to beat. Don't tell me the Eagles or the Washington football team are competent teams to beat in your division. So again, yeah, been a good schedule, and their numbers are leading towards identical, man. I really like your insight here. Yeah, I, I definitely see it like that. And what I like, what I just chalk that up to, man, is it's pretty much anything in life. It's all about timing. It's all about timing when you get into the right system with the right people and the right schedule, the right, just everything falls into place. And that, that's the world, baby. It's in any life, any sport, any job, anything. If the stars align correctly, you will be successful. So absolutely. And people are talking crap about Dak, right? Getting the money. So here's the thing, right? Like Mike Jones is probably going to get paid because he'll probably stay winning. The mm-hmm. team is winning in spite of him, right? Because of the fact that, you know, like a Dak Prescott, people are going crazy when he's not putting up or he's struggling, not putting up crazy numbers. People are talking crap about him. But here's the thing. The Cowboys were at their worst when either Dak wasn't there or Dak was putting up numbers. Because even last year, he was going through like some record-breaking games here. One, yeah. one in three, realistically, one in three by himself and games that he completed. One in three. The best, whenever he had his best season as a passer, eight and eight not even making it to the playoffs. So I think yep. that complements the team. He is the leader. He's there to fill that leadership void, which Mac does. Mac, they got similar leadership roles right there. And I don't think that this offense, like the Pats, aren't built to have Mac Jones carry them. Just like Dak isn't no. made to carry a team. So that's yeah. what I think the best case scenario for Mac Jones is. You know, I think it's just Dak Prescott. I, I don't know, man. I, I, I thought of that. I think that it's pretty fair. Your your football insight, man, is very refreshing. It's very new, and I like how you're comparing it. It's throwing out the Jimmy Garoppolo. Comp- I would have never compared Mac Jones to Dak Prescott. When you say those two names to me, I think superstar and game manager. But the way you just broke that down to me, yeah, that, that completely game, makes sense. But he, he is like, you know, no disrespect, right? And look, because I'm not, because I, I, I like to, sh- I used to shit on Dak a lot, right? because of all these numbers, right? But here's the thing. Tell me the one quarterback that can get nowadays, right? The only one, there's one exception to this, and that was Andrew Luck, and he retired early. But tell me one quarterback that can overcome just a dumpster fire, you know, that doesn't need help. Look at Mahomes. You took Mahomes, you you gave him everything, and then you took away two players, two tackles in the Super Bowl, and he was running for his life. Brady, look at Brady, his last year in New England. You took away some weapons there, Security blanket, you took away Gronk, doesn't look the same. Yeah. So no one can do this by themselves. So it's not a bad thing on Dak getting the money. I think people need to relax in Dallas. And I oh, think that Mac Jones is going to get paid. Hey, man, you take you take yeah. the check, man. You take the check. I'm not going to blame Always anyone for take getting the, the money. Check. Yeah. This is, a, this is a short-lived window when you're in your athletic prime. Whenever there's a chance to get money from athletics, take the money. Absolutely. So I'm not going to dog the guy for that. So I think Cowboy fans, I'm telling you right now, Josh, I don't know what, how exactly your sports upbringing was, man, but the Dallas Cowboys fans are the most annoying human beings on the planet. right now. <laughs> <laughs> you hear that, Dustin Jacoby? The <laughs> Dallas Cowboy fans. <laughs> they are the worst, man. They are the absolute worst, man. I'm telling you, thinking that it's a Super Bowl. It's a Super Bowl this year. God. Oh, it gets me upset, man. I told everyone. I told everyone, you're going to win one playoff game depending on the matchup, and that's it. It's over. You ain't doing shit. Hey, God man, damn. I get told that. I get told that every single time from being a Steelers fan. Oh, we lose this. It doesn't matter. We got seven. It doesn't matter. It's like, I, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, Super Bowl matchup for you for, for you this year, man. You, you, you still Ooh. think you can pick one? I definitely think that. I, I see Tampa Bay in it for sure. Man, um, it's, it's tough, man. 
dude i i don't know if it's just maybe me being biased because i've been watching man in the arena lately but is it good i I need to watch that oh my god dude that's that's so cool like obviously you know diehard Steelers fans uh, I'm supposed to hate the Patriots but everyone tries to hate the Patriots because they're winning and Tom Brady but it's literally like giving someone their roses we're we are in the the era that you wish you could have watched Michael Jordan or like the people who aren't really understanding what they're seeing like this dude is an old man in relation to football age and he's out there just slinging it being at a top tier quarterback almost at all every week and it's so amazing to see it's insane man i'm, I'm gonna watch it man I, I need to put that on the on, on the wish list here man i've been watching a lot of what is it a lot of the challenge you know i don't know if people are, yeah a lot and back in the day mtv man i've been watching all those scenes yeah i like i like seeing people compete man i just like, comp- yeah. like people are just competing for a, a money that like nowadays like they're back in the day it was like a hundred thousand dollars i mean I mean, I'd, I'd love 100 G's, man, but you burn through that within the Dude, month, bro. You go through that so fast. <laughs> yeah. it's, so it's, fast. Cr- it's crazy, man. So the Hollies are coming up, man, and I'm going to go ahead and segue here towards the end, man. But favorite holiday gift, Christmas gift that you got. I don't know if you celebrate Christmas, but any gift that you got during the holiday season, Josh, for you, man. Let let the people inside know, the people that watch you compete, let know who the human is here in Josh. Ah. Uh, so is it a gift that I received? Yeah, yeah. Your favorite gift, man. Oh, uh, I would. So I, I'm not very big into Christmas. Like I celebrate Same. Christmas. My family, they, they love it. Uh, yeah. I just, the holidays, they're a little too blown up for me. But I have received here, a guy. really cool gift before. Uh, my girlfriend bought me this really cool uh, gunmetal gray watch okay. that, you know, I still have to this day i absolutely love it probably the nicest thing that i've ever owned because i'm just not a materialistic person i just i go about my day that's it uh so yeah shout out to her for giving me that watch that's probably like the most memorable one i could think of you watch any christmas movies man do you have a favorite one yeah um crap what's the lampoon one? Oh, uh, oh god you know when i talked about this Wait. yesterday the Chris, the Christmas one, yeah. The Griswolds. I forget the name. No, the Griswolds. Yeah, yeah the Griswolds. Yeah, the Griswolds. I uh, that's I watched it for truthfully the first time from start to finish. Like I've seen clips and whatnot. First time, start to finish. Last year, fell in love with it. I think it's absolutely hilarious. I love the dry humor. I love all that. What's your favorite? Uh, do you get to enjoy some food here? You know, like what's your favorite a holiday dish, man? I know you're you're, Dude, you're competing uh, and stuff. For the past a uh, month and a half I've been on strict training diet just you know <laughs> I was in my ear like oh you might get a short notice UFC fight before the year's up so I've just been trying to be ready and now that you know this weekend I ain't get a call so I'm gonna go home for Christmas and I cannot wait to have some of my grandma's homemade apple pie she makes amazing dumplings uh ham mashed potatoes gravy like the whole nine. I'm pumped for it all. You're you're gonna are you gonna be his home uh, Pittsburgh over there, or you're you're talking about yeah the yeah. I'm leaving. Uh, so I'm in Denver now, but I'm leaving Friday. I'm gonna head home to Pittsburgh for like ten days or so, just to hang out with everyone, see the family. I'll be training too while I'm home, just to get a refresher, and then come back out here to start the year and just you know jump into 2022 with a head full of steam. The most random question I'm ever going to ask somebody on this show. I'm going to do this right here, man. What's your thought on Ashbula? Ashbula, man. You ever watch those if things. That, <laughs> if that grown ass man came up to me and hit me, I would. I, little fun fact here: I was a kicker in high school, and I also kicked a little bit in college. <laughs> I would kick a fifty yard fifty yard field goal. A grown ass man. What do you look like going up and just punching another human? Like, like that's right. assault. That's assault, brother. <laughs> <laughs> his man his laugh though man is something else dude <laughs> hey he's i don't know who his marketing guy is or whatever but he is leaning into this thing all props to him i hope he makes a chunk of change off of it and does a bunch of cool stuff that's just it's a really cool thing to see yeah man it's it's insane josh as we're gonna end this here man uh, a goal you have for 2022 man what's the end game for you josh what are you working 2022 I will be in the UFC. 
There is no ifs, there's no ands, there's no buts. I had a goal this year to be in it by Halloween. I slipped up on that goal, but I came back with a win. Next year, you will see me in the UFC. I don't care if I have to climb up a mountain and make a sacrifice to the UFC gods to accept me in here. I am going to be in the UFC, and that is my 2022 goal. Anything you want to let the audience know before we sign out? Hey, man, have a good holiday. Have a good Christmas. Anything you celebrate, that's all I want to know. <laughs> hey, well, Josh, thank you so much for, for joining us today on the show. And to anyone out there listening, you're going out for the holidays. Be safe, folks. Don't drink and drive, folks. It's, it's a terrible time do of not. year to do that right now. Stay safe out there. To you, Josh, thank you. And to all the audience, thank you, guys. Have a happy holiday. I'll catch you later, guys. Goodbye.